This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Create a beautiful website quickly without ever having to write a line of code. The images from the James Webb Space Telescope have been nothing short of spectacular. Every image tells a unique story about some corner of the universe. But there's another story as to how the images are actually created that I really can only just begin to scratch the surface of. It turns out there's an entire team of astronomers whose sole job is to bring those web public release images to life, and that team consists of two people. Joe De Pasquale and Alisa Pagan are the two imaging visualization specialists at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and they were gracious enough to give us a masterclass in how they process different images. Now, different images require different approaches, and individual people also have their different workflows. So I thought it'd be better to break this interview down into two parts because Elise is gonna show us how she made the images of the Carina Nebula. And then in our next video, Joe will show us how he created the near cam image of SMAX 0723, otherwise known as Webb's first deep field. We're gonna get into all of the gory nerdy details here, and that's going to include everything from how to download the raw images from MAST to how to make your final production in Photoshop or in GIMP. So without further ado, let's get into it and learn how to process web images. So Joe and Elisa, thank you so much for, for showing us how to create web images and, and uh, welcome to Launchpad. Thank you, happy to be here. Cool. Yeah, thanks for having us, really yeah. excited. Oh, it's gonna be great. So um, one thing I did wanna ask you is, when we get images down from web, right, they're not coming in as full color. And I thought we should just sort of start from the very beginning and kind of work our way through what it's like to process some, some images. So if the images are not coming down full color, what are they coming down as? So the, the raw data from the telescope is, um, you know, the detectors, don't, they don't see color. They are infrared detectors. They're sensitive to infrared light. And the way that we get color in the images is by using filters to filter out different wavelengths of infrared light. What the filter is, is a mechanism on the telescope itself that puts a filter in front of the detector and allows you to view the light of a specific range of wavelengths. And so for the deep field image, there were six filters um, ranging from near infrared at 0 0.9 microns all the way out to 4.4 microns. And we then process that data it stays as a black and white image until we composite it together in a photo editing program and apply color to it and then blend the six filters together in color to create a color image. So I was wondering if you can then tell us starting from scratch, you know, you have these uh, black and white images coming down. Uh, where do we go from there? Uh, Elisa, how does this all work? Yeah, so I can actually show where we get the data. The first thing we do is we go to mass.stsci.edu. And depending on the data, uh, it will change sort of the advanced search options that you use. But you always want to start with the advanced search. That will, that will help you refine the search as much as possible. And so the easiest way is actually to get the proposal ID. And so if you are interested in working on an image that we already released on the web telescope site, we actually have this information on the release itself and the fast facts. That's the quickest way to get straight to the observations. But if you don't have the observation ID, that's fine. And if you're interested in a particular subject, particular object, you can put the name of the object in there to get the coordinates. And then we can do a cone search. Now, I'm going to look for Karina, uh, but I'm actually going to use a specific ID because this is actually, Karina is a very, very large nebula. And so this is a very specific region of the Karina. It's a very small star forming region. So we're going to enter that in there and that will automatically populate our RA and deck. So our coordinates. And then, of course, we want the web data. So we go to the mission that we want and then it's searching right here. You can see that these are the parameters that I've set and we have 10 records found, so that's great. We could filter this further down if we wanted to by instrument, but I think we're good. We also have filter options on the left sidebar once we've actually executed the search. And what's really nice is you get this little panel here, uh, Astro View, which lets you see the footprints of the instruments. So here is the near cam mosaic footprint and then here is the MIRI. And you can also see the region of the Carina Nebula this is, and if you zoom out, you can see it's like this far region right here of the Carina Nebula. 
And so we have the filters that Joe was talking about. So this is the information we need to make the full color image. And we're not going to be worried about Miri right now. We're going to focus on near cam. So we're just going to filter that down. And so we have our six filters here. Uh, so this is actually masquerading as the wide 444 filter, but it is actually the 470 narrowband filter. It gets a little confusing because there's two filter wheels and one's passing through the other. So instead of just using a clear filter, you just have the wider band um, and then eventually goes to the narrow band. So it kind of acts like a clear filter. So we want to download all this data. These are quite large files, so that is a warning. Uh, you can select all the data just by doing this. You can go to this download basket here. You can click on that. So you have minimum recommended products already checked, which is good if uh, you don't plan on recalibrating or re-reducing the data, which you probably don't. If you just want the science images to make your full color imagery and use the already calibrated data, then you can keep this the same. If you're very interested in going and finding the raw data to recalibrate it yourself or re-reduce it, you can do that. It just takes a lot of time and a lot of work. So what you really are only concerned about is the FITS files. So you can hit this extension right here. Go under here. And even within this FITS file, we are only concerned with the 2D image. So anything that you want in terms of filters for creating the full color image, you're only worried about this 2D FITS file. So then you can just download it. And I'm not going to download it right now because <laughs> it is quite a big file. It's like three gigabytes because it has extra extensions with it beyond just the science image. But you don't need that extra stuff. Uh, that stuff was just files that were created in the calibration process, like your mass and things like that. So you just want to use your 2D FITS file. So let's just pretend I downloaded that. And let's pretend I just downloaded all that stuff. So here I've opened the FITS file, one of the filters, into FITS Liberator, and this is what you see straight from the telescope. So as you can see, it doesn't have spectacular color, and you can't even, even see a lot of detail, and that's because the dynamic range of these telescopes are so large, they're so sensitive, so there's lots of brightness values, and we have to do something called stretching in order to reveal these details near the dark end of this histogram here. So right now it's in a linear scale, so just as it came out of the telescope, Telescope, but we can apply different functions to stretch the data in such a way that we're revealing more data, but we're not removing or clipping any data. So we can contain the black points and the white points. So as you can see here, we can start manipulating this and bring out more detail. Now, we do not want to oversaturate these regions here with the bright stars. So it's sort of a balance and we can manipulate things in this function in order to reveal the details. So this, this number tends to work well for this particular data set just because I know, uh, but it would be different depending on the data that you get. But as we can see here, we're revealing the image, all that detail that was locked away just a second ago. And so I'm just going to move this white point over here to the right a little bit because I want to preserve these stars. Now, you can see that it's already been saturated by the telescope itself. That's actually intrinsic to the actual observation, not something mm. that we're doing here. And that's something that Joe and I replaced later down the road using an algorithm. Um, so if we bring that into like PixInsight or another editor, we can actually replace this middle value with the nearest neighbor, essentially, uh, that falls outside of that value. So that's what we do here. And we do this process for all the filters. So we have to stretch the data in the same way. And you can freeze your settings so that you can keep things pretty relative and consistent. And then you can open up another filter and do the same procedure, essentially. So we have to do all that. And then we'd have to save it out as a 16-bit TIFF. And that's what I would do here. And you can see that that's, that's what you save it out as. And then again, we do that for all the filters. And then we bring it in to a photo editing software. Either we can use Photoshop, we can use GIMP, which is a free software if anyone wants to use that. Uh, we have other means too. We have PixInsight, which is a program that's developed specifically for astrophotography in mind. Uh, so it's very uh, precise and accurate. 
Hi there, I just wanted to pause and remind you that you can download the scripts and even Elisa's five gigabyte Photoshop document that she's gonna walk us through that's gonna show you all of the corrections that she made to create the beautiful image of the Carina Nebula. But first, I'd like to say a big thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Squarespace is designed to give you everything you need to get a new website up and running without having to write a single line of code. To get started, you simply choose from one of the many mobile responsive templates and use their suite of built-in tools to upload your content. I'm building a new site for our annual workshop for writers, and it's amazing just how easy and intuitive it is. With its new Fluid Engine, I can move and resize elements and know that they'll always line up with the overall layout of the site. You can add any type of content, whether it's photos, videos, newsletter signups, e-commerce, or virtually anything else you can imagine. You can connect your social media accounts to display posts from your social profiles right on your website. Setting up a mailing list is a breeze. You start with an email template, apply your brand assets, and you're on your way. If you need a website, you really ought to check out squarespace.com slash launchpadastronomy for a free trial and save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. You'll find that link in the description below. All right, so once we have stretched the FITS files and we save them out as TIFFs, we can bring them into PixInsight. And we can actually bring in the FITS file straight into PixInsight as well, which I actually did here. But either way works. The script that we use in order to fill the star cores with the nearest neighbor, we can do using a script in PixInsight that Joe D. Pasquale actually modified for us to work, which has been very, very helpful in filling these in. And so here's the script. Uh, what we need to do, we're going to zoom in here to our star's core because we want to fill in these null regions with the nearest neighbor. And we can figure out what this value is by clicking here in PixInsight and holding down. And what this value is our K value. And that's the number that we want to use in our script in order for it to be replaced. Right here, it's 0 0.00165. That's the number that we're going to use. Initially, it's a little bit of trial and error when we use it. Sometimes you have to go up a little bit, uh, but we can start from here. And Elisa, while you're um, applying this script, I just wanted to give a shout out to Garrett Barrer, who is a PixInsight user. Uh, one of the great things about PixInsight is that it has a very active user community and a very active user forum. And people are always contributing their, their work and their scripts to the forum uh, to see, you know, it's just share it with the community. If it's a useful tool, then people will want to use it. And so I was able to adapt this script that Garrett had written specifically for astron astrophotographers who are using one-shot color cameras. Uh, it was designed to clean up um, blown out star cores. Um, and I adapted it to kind of do the inverse of what it was originally designed for. It was looking for like completely saturated stars. Now we're looking for, it's the same problem. We have completely saturated stars, but because of the way the pipeline processing works, that value gets set to zero basically. And so you have a black core in the star. And so this program looks for a threshold below a certain value and then replaces it, uh, those pixels with the neighboring values. Awesome. Yes, thank you to Jared and thank you, Joe, because this has made it so much easier in the ERO's process because or else we'd have to go in like one by one and replace these these star cores ourselves. And that wouldn't be fun. So carrying on with our script here, we just have to execute it. And then this is where we put our tolerance. So I believe it was 165. We'll probably have to change it. Yep, looks like we'll have to change it and that's OK. We just go back to the editor and usually sort of rounding up kind of gets you to where you're, you need to go. There we go. So now, ta-da, star Beautiful. cores are back. <laughs> all right, so we would do that for all the filters and then we would save it out as a TIFF if we hadn't had it as a TIFF already, which you can do in PixInsight. Uh, and then we can bring it into photo editing software and such as Photoshop, or we can keep actually processing the image in PixInsight. PixInsight. It kind of just depends on the data and how you want to process the image. So let's continue. So these are my filters after I've stretched them, and I've also applied the script to replace my star cores here. So here we go. There are a little bit of artifacts that remain even in the clean image. That might be a little bit hard to see on the screen, but we have some banding and things like that from the detector itself. And we have some other artifacts, maybe some cosmic rays that it's kind of hard to see because it's such a large and glorious image, but we'll take care of that. 
in the process. But so our next step is actually to prescribe the color. And so we prescribe colors in what we say chromatic order, which Joe sort of mentioned in the overall process. And that just means that the, the longest wavelength gets prescribed the reddest color, and then the shortest wavelength gets prescribed the bluest color, because that has the most physical meaning. And it. it's basically how our eyes see invisible too. So we're just transcribing the infrared light into the visible spectrum. Um, so I've divided it into long and short wavelengths. Long is just the longer wavelength, so that's my redder colors, and then my shorter colors, or not my shorter colors, but my shorter wavelengths, which are my bluer colors. And so I have here these different filters that I'm prescribing. So we can actually on screen these. So this is my longest filter here, which is the 444 right here. And that's my red. And so then I did have here, a question there. Yes. Uh, yeah, so the, well, I was wondering, when you are adding those colors, are you just doing that via like a, a layer mask or some adjustment layer? Or how do you do that in Photoshop? Yes, no, that's great. Yeah, so we have a hue and saturation layer. There's a couple ways to do this, honestly. This just seems like the easiest way to do it. And we set uh, the color that we want on this color wheel or color spectrum with the full saturation. And then we have to adjust the lightness so that the darkest regions are like black and then the lightest regions are red. So that's kind of the balance that we want to get oh, okay. here. And we can, yeah, we can do it for all the filters and we can adjust it. There's like a lot of uh, range here, which. All right, so, so the lightest points are gonna get red and the darkest points are going to be, I'm sorry, did you say they're gonna be black or? Yes, okay, yes, great. as close to black as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but there are adjustments to color balances that we do after we have combined them all together. Okay, so that's great. kind of how we prescribe it. And so I actually have these already additive, so we can remove that to normal. So yes, this would be 335, which is our orange layer. Our 470 is a little bit of an outlier, so it's more of a yellow color. And I add it later because it's what we call continuous subtractive, which is a mouthful, but it just means that we're just trying to get the H2 admission. And we just, we're just concerned about that particular atomic transition. The, I, the ionized hydrogen emission, H2. Right. Right. And so that's what we care about. And because we can capture H2 in a lower filter, 212 narrow band, this would actually fall in the yellow region. So this is why it doesn't break any rules, essentially. So we can still prescribe it yellow. Uh, and, but I do that a little bit later in the process because that's kind of funky. <laughs> okay. And so I do the same. I go down the line to my shorter wavelengths and we have 200 in the green. And then we have our Cyan, or Cyan, I always mess that up, in 187. And then our shortest wavelength, which is our blue color. And then we're going to combine these additively to get our full color image. And this will be our initial full color image, which we're then going to manipulate to color balance it, white balance it, and such, just to reveal the details as much as possible and get, get us our final image. So, so Lisa, here, I have a question. When yes. you said uh, 187, you meant those are the filter names, right? Right. Those okay. are the filter names. Yes, that can be a little bit confusing because we deal with microns. And like, so the, the actual microns would be 0.9 up to 0.4.4. Uh, but in this case, yes, the filter names are 90 and 187. And this is really just for my knowledge so that I know which one I, I'm prescribing so I don't get all, get all messed up. So that's the, that's the beauty of Photoshop. Okay, so here we're gonna combine all of the filters together and this will be our first full color image here. And so I'm kind of doing it layer by layer and then we will get somewhere. Okay, so this is our initial full color image and it's it's really beautiful on its own but there's still things that we want we want to manipulate so for me this is where it becomes a little bit more subjective even though we are following some like scientific principles and artistic principles in the sense that we do want to white balance the image and color correct it just like a photographer would um, but to me this doesn't seem very natural uh, like having sort of these like really red dust and then this kind of teal gas it just it doesn't seem like something I would see in real life, I guess. Um, and that's where I start to shift the colors a little bit to sort of mimic more natural life. So I feel like these orangey, rusty colors and this more blue color 
sort of translates better. And so I'm just kind of shifting the colors up the spectrum or down the spectrum, and but I'm keeping and maintaining the chromatic order and the relationships maintain the same. And so that's what I do. Oh, so, sorry. So I was going to say, so how would you go about doing that shift? Uh, how would you... <gasps> How do you make that actually happen? Because it's a it's a really uh, dramatic change that you just had. Right. So there's a couple ways that you can do it. You can actually manipulate the uh, colors that you prescribed initially. So maybe instead of having like a full on red, your starting point for the 444 filter could actually be more of an orange color. So you can kind of shift everything down the line. And that's essentially what I'm doing. Uh, but I'm doing it a little bit easier by actually taking a different hue saturation layer and actually shifting it instead of physically having to shift all the colors. Ah, okay. All right. I yeah. see how you did that. Wow. Yeah. Really nice. And then now it's a matter of color balancing and contrast. So this is quite a bit of a change here too, but I'm really just trying to separate those features right now, but the difference between sort of the gas and the dust, because that's, that's the science that's happening here and the processes that are happening here. And it's very interesting. But at this point, I'm noticing because of all the curves adjustment, it also feels very saturated to me. And I don't think I've ever processed an image and I'm like, oh my God, like that's too saturated. I need to tone it down. And usually it's like the reverse where you have like a very gray image and you're trying to like bring out the details in sort of the, the filters. So color separation is not really a big problem with the Carina Nebula. You get a lot of information. Uh, so the next step is kind of toning that down, making it feel a little bit more organic, and then again, emphasizing the details and the processes in these filters. And I also, at this time, we're working with the scientists to create these products. So we're not just kind of flying solo here. We are talking with them. It's an iterative process and we're making sure we're showcasing the data in the best way possible. So at this stage, uh, when I was sharing this stage of the data with the scientists, they felt like we're kind of losing like the 3D uh, nature of the mountain or the dust region. And they kind of uh, wanted to bring that out a little bit more because it felt like it was a little bit overshadowed by the dust. So that's kind of like a, something that would happen uh, that would change sort of the way that we process the image is those conversations with the scientist. And so after that conversation, I kind of went back in and it seems a little bit subtle here, but it sort of just makes it a, feel a little bit more organic, a little bit more natural, not too saturated. And then also you see sort of the details in this this mountain that we call it, in the cosmic cliffs uh, that we want to, to show and give that that 3D feeling. Uh, and then now it's now it's really subjective and it's really just a matter of bringing everything together. And it's more of a personal choice at this point, uh, since we've sort of addressed all the science behind it. And so I just this is sort of the end stage where I kind of tone things down even a little bit more because it felt a little too yellow, um, a little too dramatic. And I wanted to feel more like more spacey, more ethereal, um, but also still have that and maintain that contrast between the two distinct regions. And uh, yeah, that's how you uh, that's how you process an image. That's amazing. So I was wondering, how did you how did you achieve this final adjustment? I'm just curious. Like you said, that you wanted to kind of tone it down just a little bit. How did you pull that off? Yeah, so that's kind of a little bit of both of the tools that I used before, where I'm sort of adjusting the scaling or the the hue and saturation. I'm just shifting it a little bit there. I'm I'm increasing sort of the local contrast. So like I don't want to increase the contrast too much between the two different regions because they already like are very abrupt. So I'm just trying to look at the details and increase those little local contrast adjustments. And then it's like a lot of curves, a lot of adjustments in sort of tonality. And then, yeah, mainly like messing with the hue and saturation. And there's lots of layers. This is all condensed into a file that could be supported uh, by this. Video. Uh, this file is much larger. And yeah, we just have tons and tons of layers and it can get a little bit confusing. So these have been flattened. Um, but that's the overall process. It's, it's just very iterative and it is a little bit of an by eye process when you get to a certain stage and like how people react to it. That, that's amazing. And, and uh, you made that look easy. I know that obviously was not easy to do, uh, at least not all at once. But I l really uh, appreciate how you just kind of walked us through all of those major steps. And uh, it sounds like some of this is just a little bit of trial and error. Is that right? 
Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think I probably process this image at least four times um, just to make sure, you know, because there's so many different options to best represent the data. You definitely want to you want to do it, do it justice as much as you can. So it's definitely worth taking that time to do it. And then also talk with the scientists, talk to Joe, get those opinions that like are very important. I, and that, that's a huge advantage, I think, that you have over anybody downloading anything from Mass. You get to actually work with the scientists and make sure that you're presenting everything just exactly as as they'd like to show it to you. So, wow, that, mm -hmm. that's amazing. Well, thanks, Elisa. That's wonderful. Oh, my pleasure. Amazing. All of that work to produce just this one image of the Carina Nebula. But what a result it is. It's a beautiful piece of work, and thank you so much, Elisa, for showing us how it's done. In our next video, Joe De Pasquale is going to show us how he processed Webb's first deep field using a very different kind of workflow. As always, a huge thanks to my patrons for helping to keep Launchpad Astronomy going, and I'd like to welcome William Garber and Michael H. as my newest supporters. And if you'd like to join me on this journey through this incredible universe of ours, well, please make sure you subscribe and ring that notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new videos. Until next time, stay curious, my friend.